history. Okay, that was the inquiry. That was the inquiry. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I, you can tell how relieved we are as co-deacons of this church that we have Pastor Larry with us today because we're floundering like crazy. Um, are there any announcements today? Oh my goodness. Oh, Carol, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, oh, it comes after the announcements. We're okay. <laughs> okay, if, it, if nobody has an announcement, I do. I am really, really excited. What? Oh, they, she does have one. Any other announcements? Okay, I have a very special announcement. Our prayers have been answered. Uh, this is uh, Reverend Larry Brickner Wood, who will be joining us as an interim minister for the next year. Uh, we are so excited to have him with us. And um, he's asked for a short introduction, so I'm, I'm kind of happy that I don't have to say a whole lot because we have all of this information right here in the bulletin. And um, one thing I would really like to say, though, is that for 22 years, Larry did the um, Way is Me? Yeah, campus, ministry. campus ministry at UNH. And for 22 years, he ministered to kids, young adults from all over the world. And um, he's a gift, he's a joy, and we are just so, so blessed to have him with us. Larry Bruckner Wood. Thank you. It's a joy to be with you all, and I look forward to talking with all of you as, as we walk this road together. This is beautiful. Thank you. I love, I love great art. I love any art. <laughs> and our, our, our wonderful secretary, CLA, our, was on top of her program today. Did she not bring a beautiful peace lily plant that she put in um, Reverend Larry's office for him this morning? Um, so thank you, Andrea, for doing that. Would you join me in the call to worship? Let us praise the great and awesome name of the Holy One. Let us praise the great and awesome name of the Mighty One. Let us praise the great and awesome name of the everlasting God. Will you join me in the uh, unison prayer? Radiant God, we come to you on this mountaintop to experience your glory. You come to us in the valleys. We meet you in gladness in a place where heaven and earth collide. May our worship of you encourage us on the journey and make us aspire to reflect your kingdom in the world. Transform us and keep us near to you. Amen. We will please join us in hymn number 73. Rejoice and come in.
is a, it's a blessing to be with you all. I know I've, I've, I've guest preached over here over the years, but it's been at least three years. I haven't preached during the pandemic. Um, the, I, the folks in Lee wanted me to assure you that I'm not going to bring a global pandemic uh, with me here. I, I started in Lee literally as the pandemic emerged. And um, so they keep calling me the pandemic pastor. And I said, well, it's not really the title I was looking for. So um, I, if I remembered, I'd like to invite, do the kids come forward? You all come down here if you want to. So. I'd like to invite kids and children and kids of any age, um, because there's no limitation to come on down. Um, is a better seat up here. That way we get to see you all. It... Hi, that's a great outfit. Any other takers? <laughs> all right. Oh man, is that a taco Taco-saurus? Huh, is that a, a dinosaur that eats tacos? Oh, <laughs> you don't want to sit down, or, or do you want to sit down on the pew? Where would you like to? Sit? You can sit down on the pew. That's probably more comfortable. And I'll just sit down here. Any other takers? Okay, okay. I'm gonna be. I got high expectations. So as as time goes on here. Now, uh, how are you doing? You're good. How are you doing? You're good. Yeah, you don't always have to be good, but if you're doing good, that's that makes me happy. Yeah, how was your week? Good. <laughs> well, how was your week? I bet it was good. Was it good? So, what are your names? Emmett. Emmett? What is your name? Molly. Oh, Molly Rose. Well, I'm Larry. So uh, it's nice to meet you, and I'm going to be with you for a while as an interim minister. And I love journeys. I love journeying. You know what a journey is? It's kind of like, yeah, an expedition. It could be a short journey. It could be across the street to someone's house. But I love, I love to hike. And I love mountains. And so I brought some stuff that I use when I go hiking. And these, these are boots. These are older boots that I don't use so much anymore. But I always bring my boots, some kind of boots, Particularly as I get older, I fall down more. Um, my kids have remarked on that. Say, you know, Dad, you fall down more than you used to. And I said, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes when you go hiking, you need some other things. I always try to take a hat, you know, because I'm, I'm Irish and my skin gets really red when I'm out in the sun too long. And let's see, what else do I bring? I try to bring... Oh, sunglasses. I try to bring, these are my favorite sunglasses. I got these at the bike shop in Durham. Let's see, I kind of make sure um, I've got other things here. Oh, let's, this is so lovely. I'm trying to make sure I bring, you know what these are? That's a good guess. This is little binoculars. Yeah, the little binoculars so that I can see Oh, I got the wrong side. <laughs> oh, no. Y'all look little here. So let me see. Yeah. And, ah, it's a pretty good looking crew out there. But, you know, sometimes when you, you hike, you often, sometimes you can hike down into a place, but you got to come back some point. Sometimes you can hike and it's completely flat, such as on the ocean, at least the ocean over here. But sometimes you're hiking up, right? You're going up. And often, People, when they hike into the mountains, they feel like they can get connected to God more easily. For many people, mountains are sacred places. Now, is there a place where you feel more connected to God or to even your own heart and spirit? Are there special places for you? You all can participate in this too. You might have special places. Any like special places where you can just feel that peace, God might be talking to you? No, <laughs> no way. But it could be that everywhere, that, you know, there are some really gifted people where it can be anywhere. That can happen anywhere. Nature, you know, for so many people, it is in nature. It is in nature. Is it, for me, ever since I was your age, that's where God felt closest to me, was out, in, whether it's at the ocean or on the mountain or in the woods. 
How about some of you all? What are some of your sacred special places? Here. Oh, that's wonderful. Here. This is sacred place, not just in here. Any others? Pardon me? Ireland. There is something special about Ireland. The whole notion of thin places comes from the Celtic tradition, which any others? The ocean. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, Pine Mountain, of course. Yeah. Pardon me? Horton Center. That is a special sacred place uh, and has been. Um, anyone else? Spencer Pond in Maine. Yeah. 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 Any others? <laughs> French town in Sanbornville. Well, you, you know, part of it is there is something to going out and where it's maybe quieter or where you feel at peace and then God, somehow you can feel God more closely, but we always have to come back to our lives, to the places where it might be messier. We have to do homework, or we got to do chores, or we have to make dinner, or we have to cut the grass, or we have to paint something. And you know, God is there too. I used to think, oh, I could only talk to God out, out in the wilderness where it was completely quiet. I couldn't have anything that was human made. And I said, well, how foolish. I think it was God who said to me, well, that's just a foolish way of thinking, Larry. I'm everywhere. I'm in those special sacred places, and they're really important. But I'm also in the ditches that you might fall in. I'm in the mud pond that you might get stuck in. I'm in the rain. I'm in the blizzard that you might get caught in. And so sometimes you might be looking for me, and sometimes I'm right here, right here. One thing I've learned, and one thing in the scripture today, one thing uh, that they talk about, Jesus takes three friends up to a mountain, and they're up there. It's Peter, James, and John, three of his closest followers. And they get up there, and then a cloud overtakes the mountain, and then Jesus starts to glow. And then two great prophets, Moses and Elijah, appear, and Peter wants to build them tents or tabernacles so they can sleep. But he misses the point that something special is happening in that moment. That it's another way that God is saying, this is my beloved, my son. This is a special time. Not only is Jesus the son of God, but you all are being transformed. So you can put your hammer down and just let it be. So I hope that wherever you go, whether it's up high, whether it's down low, whether it's even in your room, if it's in the kitchen, if it's in your classrooms, if it's in your neighbor's house, I hope you can feel the presence of God because God is always with you. So I, I usually say a prayer when, uh, where, do you, where do you all go from here? Do you stay here? Yeah, okay. No, I got one yes, I got one no. <laughs> you all can go wherever you, you normally would. So, uh, well, I'll just say a prayer anyhow, unless you all want to pray. Would you like to pray? Not yet? Okay. Would you like to pray, Molly Rose? Yeah? You want to say a prayer? Or do you want me to pray? I'll tell you what, I'll pray this time. And then you all think about praying in the weeks to come, okay? And you all pray with us too. Gracious and loving God, thank you for the blessings that you bring into our lives. Thank you for Emmett and Molly Rose. Thank you for all of your children gathered here, the one sitting, the one standing, the one snoozing, the one smiling, the one wondering. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming down. I gotta get up and I'm gonna go up to the mountain. <laughs> Killers.
The first scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 24, verses 12 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you tab tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rode with his servant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, tarry here for us until we come to you again. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a cause, let them go to them. Let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called Moses. He called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. And Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And the gospel lesson may sound very familiar as part of it was the children's story this morning. <laughs> uh, it's from Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses one through nine. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his garments became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is well that we are here. If you wish, I will make three booths here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when lo, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were filled with awe. But Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the son of man is raised from the dead. I gotta make sure I'm on. Yeah, on yeah. I felt like the sermon came up quick. Doesn't come up quite so quick at Lee, you know. <laughs> Huh, is this time for the sermon? So I usually like to come down there, so I, I may wander down there. Um, so before I start, I, I want to apologize. I had planned to get a haircut before, such as it is, um, before I came. Uh, and so I texted, I have a kind of a celebrity stylist who I followed through four shops. And she didn't have an appointment until the second week in March. And, you know, I had the dilemma, do I go to someone else? But no. Uh, so I'm going to look a little ragged uh, until the second week of March. So I apologize. It, it, at the campus ministry, I had a colorful hat that I put on because for some of us, as we get older, the top of our heads is more prevalent, more evident. I know that because people often take pictures facing down, particularly selfies, and uh, it's a humbling moment to see yourself in some of those. I love poetry and I'm, I'm going to uh, do a couple of poems today and I want to start one. It's from one of my very favorite poets, Gary Snyder. I don't know if you, some of you know Gary's work, but this is a beautiful poem called For All. It's set in a place that uh, I've been to is special to me, the Northern Rockies. It's called For All. Ah, to be alive on a mid-September morn fording a stream, barefoot, pants rolled up, holding boots, pack on, sunshine, ice in the shallows, northern Rockies. 
rustle and shimmer of icy creek waters. Stones turn underfoot, small and hard has toes. Cold nose dripping, singing inside, creek music, heart music, smell of sun on gravel. I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the soil of Turtle Island and to the beings who thereon dwell, one ecosystem in diversity under the sun with joyful interpenetration for all. That was a favorite of ours at the campus ministry. We often read it before our suppers. Ah. So as I told you all in the, the, the children's time, I love to hike. Uh, now I grew up at, at the ocean at Virginia Beach and uh, it was flat. Uh, there were some man-made, it, it was where the first landfill that was just garbage that piled up, Mount Rushmore, Mount Trashmore is what we called it, but pretty much flat. Um, and then I went to school the, in college in the mountains of Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley between the Blue Ridge and the Allegheny. And I just fell in love with mountains. And we hiked a lot. Sometimes we hiked instead of going into class, um, which, you know, was evident as the end of the semester came. But it was a beautiful place. And I, I loved hiking. Uh, there's just something about going out there, ever conscious that some of us can't go to those places and that we need to be conscious of allowing folks of all types and all abilities and all ways of being to be able to get to those sacred places as well. But I've been blessed to be able to see a lot of them, uh, even as I get older, to still go to some of them. And so usually when you set out on a hike, you just think this is going to be glorious because you're, of course, I'm always picturing a beautiful sunny day that everything will be perfect on the top of the mountain. Things will be blooming and everything will be perfect. But I've come to know I'm an old person that that doesn't always work out. In fact, sometimes it is dense fog and cloud on the mountain or on the way to the mountain. In fact, sometimes it's so thick you can't see anything, including the people you're with. We were hiking once, myself and two friends, Paul and R.B. We were hiking with Paul's dog, the white German shepherd, Jasmine. And we were on hiking in Mount Rogers, which is a glorious part in Southwest Virginia, the highest peaks in Virginia. And we were hiking up to Mount Rogers, the highest peak in Virginia, uh, 6,500 feet. And so we were hiking and, you know, we had camped the night before, so it's gonna be a beautiful day. Well, it was raining, but we said, you know, it's, uh, I think one of us said, I think it's gonna clear up. We had no evidence that was going to clear up, um, but it was that, you know, it's what optimists do. No, it'll be good. It'll be good. Well, it just got rainier and rainier and the fog got thicker and thicker. So we got to the top of Mount Rogers and uh, we stumbled into the sign that says highest peak in Virginia because we couldn't see it. And we said, well, this, this is luckily we'd been there before, but huh. so on the way down, this fog got thicker, the rain got thicker, we got grumpier and grumpier. And then Jasmine, the white German shepherd, just chased something into the woods and took off. Now, Jasmine had been doing that, but uh, we said, oh, Jasmine will come back. So we spent about an hour and a half looking for Jasmine. Couldn't find Jasmine at all. It was a sad moment because Paul loved his dog, Jasmine, and we loved Jasmine too. But we realized it was going to be getting dark and we needed to go down. So we left and we walked down, sad. Uh, it did get dark. We did get uh, caught in the dark. None of us had brought flashlights. Uh, we were young and optimistic because we thought it was going to clear up. And so we got down there and we were mourning Jasmine, who was rummaging through this beautiful part of the highlands of Virginia. Well, as we got to the end of the trail, there was Jasmine at the bottom of the trail waiting on us, looking at us like, Really? What took you so long? <laughs> Mountains throughout my life have seemed like the thin places. As, as we talked about, the thin places in the Celtic tradition are those places where heaven and earth are close and integrated, where God's presence can be more evident. And for many of us, they are special, unique places. There are some thin places that are kind of collectively acknowledged as thin places. There's places where heaven and earth, the veil between heaven and earth lifts. And there are certain times of the year, such as around 
um, Halloween or Salwain, as they call it, where that veil is lifted. And that's one of the reasons we celebrate All Saints Day and All Souls Day at those times of year. And for many folks, those thin places are truly where they can feel connected to God, where they believe they can pray more easily, pray more fully. I know as a kid, the outdoors felt like a place for me. I grew up in a tradition in the Irish Roman Catholic tradition that at the time said that God was only in the building. Now, even as a kid, I didn't understand that because we were taught that God was omnipotent and all powerful. So as a kid, I couldn't understand why God would only be in the building. Uh, God was certainly capable of getting outside the building. And also it was those places where God felt most present for me. And it was really one of the first times as a little kid where I said, you know, sometimes the people in authority don't always know the answers. Sometimes, I didn't think this at the time, but I've come to realize they're doing the best they can often. But sometimes they're so stuck in what they were taught or in the dogma of it that they get constrained. And so we put God into a box. But God likes boxes when we're given gifts. But God doesn't like to be in a box. These passages that we talked about in uh, Exodus and in Matthew are wonderful passages, and you probably picked up the parallels between them, right? They're very similar. There are at least seven points, parallel points between the two passages. Um, one, the transfiguring and the giving of the law to Moses were both mountaintop experiences. They both happened on the mountain. Jesus takes three companions, Peter, James, and John, and Moses does too. That's less evident, but elsewhere in Exodus, Moses takes Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. The reference to six days in Matthew mirrors Exodus 24, 16, where a cloud covered Mount Sinai for six days, and on the seventh day, God spoke to Moses. Matthew 17, 2 said that Jesus' face shone like the sun, Exodus 34, 29 through 35 says that the skin of Moses' face was shining. The bright cloud that covered the mountain in Matthew is similar to the cloud described in Exodus 24, 16, the cloud that brought the glory of the Lord. In both accounts, the witnesses to this reacted in fear. And Moses and then Jesus calmed them. Do not fear. Now, at the time, the, the Gospel of Matthew is one of the Gospels that's most steeped in the Jewish tradition. Sometimes it's just a good reminder to remember to folks that Jesus was Jewish. And Jesus was very knowledgeable and steeped in that Judaic tradition. And so the telling of this story, because in the Matthew Gospel, the churches that were evolving were in synagogues. And many of them were synagogues who were moving towards Jesus as Messiah. Not every synagogue was, and there was quite a bit of conflict at the time. But the synagogue that comes out of that Matthew's tradition comes out of is a Pharisaic tradition. Not all, not all the Pharisees believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but very much the Gospel of Matthew comes out of that. So the reason that often when Jesus is talking in Matthew, in the analogy or two, uh, Hebrew scriptures, it's because the listeners would have known that. They would have understood that this passage in Matthew is very similar to the passage in Exodus, Moses, that they would have understood that this was a transformative moment, not just a transfiguring moment, but a transforming moment that they were to listen to. Now, these passages are interesting to me. For a long time, I didn't know what the word transfigured meant. It's really just shining and bright. Uh, I used to think Jesus got transformed, but it really is this connection that God, much such as earlier in Matthew when Jesus is baptized, the Spirit comes upon Jesus and the voice of God speaking in Matthew to the whole crowd, not just to John or Jesus, said, this is my beloved. And so on the mountain, God does the same thing to the witnesses 
This is my beloved, my only begotten. You are in the presence of the Spirit of God. Very much like Moses' account. Something special is happening here. And as you all know, in Exodus, it was a hard time. They were on a tough journey. And many times in the journey with Moses, they wanted to throw him out and say, look, um, this has taken a lot longer than we thought. This is not the way the time schedule said it would be. We should be at the promised land by now. You feel like you're leading us around in circles. And so the moment Moses goes up to the mountain is a clarifying moment. At least for some of the people, there are skeptics in every crowd that said, be patient, do not fear. God has promised to take you to the promised land. Now Moses didn't get there with the people. But they got there because Moses was the vehicle for God to lead at least for time. Now, the Matthew passage is really important to me because it talks about several things that we often don't talk about when we talk about this passage, but they come clear to me, and I think they're key points for our Christian tradition across time. One is when the mystical is happening. And the mystical can happen in every moment of our lives. But when it's happening, just savor it. Be present and center yourself in the sacredness of that moment. It can be playing with children. It could be holding the hand of a beloved. It could be the passage of a beloved to the next realm. It could be times of great tears and times of great joy. It can be on the mountaintop, but it also can be in the darkest and deepest of valleys. I'm struck by this because Peter's response, I love Peter, by the way, I, I relate to him because he's often dense. It often takes him multiple times to learn a lesson. So Peter's response to this mystical event is, I'm going to, you know, Peter, who was a fisherman, not a carpenter, but I'm going to build some houses for the three of y'all, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And Jesus is like, no, man, something pretty special is happening. The tents will come, but put the hammer down and sit with what is in front of you. Too often we try to speed through the mystical moments. We do need to be in places and states of being where we can hear God's voice. Sometimes our culture and our lives and our minds are so noisy. God's been speaking to us, but God's voice, God's a gentle voice. Sometimes God may hit us over the head, but mostly God's gentle. So sometimes when we're so busy, or someone like me who chatters a lot, God sometimes is just there going, Larry, when you take a breath, I'd like to say something. And so that's why sometimes going to those special places is a place where we connect to God because often if you're hiking alone or hiking with someone else, you're quieter than you might be in everyday life. And it feels like I can listen more. But, and so you need those places. And sometimes in your own everyday lives, we need that quiet. We need it for lots of reasons. But if we're in the business of sometimes having conversations with God, that are meant to be dialogues, not monologues. We need to be in states of mind and in places where we can truly hear. Now, when Jesus tells people to not be fearful, he's not saying, do not be afraid. Because there are lots of times when we should be fearful. It's hard to live in these times and not be scared and to not be fearful because these are fearful times. And Jesus knows that. God knows that. God is crying with us about the terror of the times that, not just that we've lived in, but that we've lived in for all of human history. What the message is, I know you're afraid. I know where you are in this moment, what's going around you makes you fearful. But do not fear, because I am with you. 
And the love that Jesus comes to bring is a fearless love that moves across borders and boundaries, that reaches the coldest of hearts, that can bring folks together that had sworn to never be in the same room with each other. It's a fearless love that can make enemies and adversaries into friends. It is the place where those sacred ground becomes common ground. It's a fearless love. So what Jesus is saying is, the human part of you might be afraid, but do not fear because I am with you, a presence that never leaves even when you feel alone. Now, another message for these things that I, it's hard for me is, as powerful as mountaintop experiences are, most of us can't stay on the mountains. Most cultures before kind of we came didn't live on mountains. They might venture up there occasionally, but they were sacred places, but you didn't build a house on them. You didn't put your villages on the top of them. They were sacred places. And so as much as it's nice to be on the mountain or in those experiences where we're just, I'm just resting, I'm at peace. Most all of us gotta come back because the real work is in the towns and the villages and in the places that are mucky and messy. It's in the places where folks who don't have enough food need to come to get their food. It's in the places where people are dying of COVID and other diseases, where healthcare workers are working 24 seven to take care of each other. It's in those places where children who don't know what to think because we as adults don't know what to say are taught by teachers who care and believe so much in education, they're willing to venture in fearlessly to continue to teach. So the mountaintop is a place where we replenish, we replenish, we refill, but we come back to do the work here because God is not one who says, it's, it's okay to escape maybe for a little while. Jesus did it. Jesus always came back to do the work with his disciples, with others. Now, the last one, at the end of the passage, Jesus, it's not the first time Jesus says this, don't tell anyone what happened here. Now, I've always struggled with that because, one, you know that they're all going to tell what happened there, right? They're humans. And um, Peter, James, and John, you know, again, um, they were not 100% right on all the time. So I'm sure they're thinking, well, we're going to tell some folks. We're at least going to tell the other nine I don't think Jesus was saying, necessarily keep this under your hat. Jesus was saying, sometimes when we come off of the mountain, we are so excited. We just want to tell folks how it was on top of the mountain, how it is. I experienced Jesus. You got to experience Jesus just like me. And so we take away their ability to experience Jesus in their own steps, in their own time, because we're force feeding them the Jesus that we experienced on the mountain, which could be different than the Jesus that the homeless person is experiencing on the street. So I think the message was keep your mouth shut because Jesus knew they weren't going to. He'd been, he'd been with them long enough to know, okay, okay, this is the team I got. I think he was saying sometimes in our exuberance, we can take away people's own experience of what it is to experience Christ. For Christians, that can be hard because so much of our tradition is about telling others how they should experience God instead of letting them experience the beauty of that fearless love from within and they have that experience that's theirs. I don't know about you all, but I've had many people try to convince me that the Jesus they follow is the one that I should follow and it has never worked because every time I've heard those words, I've come back to the God and the Jesus that I know that is that fearless love that goes across borders, that doesn't exclude anyone, that holds fast to a just and whole world, no matter what kind of division and hatred and anger I hear from others who profess to be Christian like me. My times on the mountain are really important. I encourage you all to go to the mountaintops of your own lives as much or as often as you can. Just don't stay there because we need you here.
because the real work, the work that you are called to do, the work that you all have been journeying through now for several years that may feel like the dense fog is encapsulating you, but do not fear because God is leading you to places that you can't even imagine. I want to end with a poem, another poem from another favorite poet of mine, Wendell Berry. Some of y'all, uh, he's a farmer. You may know Wendell Berry. Uh, he's in his 80s. Um, this is called Wild Geese. Horseback on Sunday morning. Wendell Berry often doesn't go to church on Sunday. He writes on Sunday mornings. He has a wonderful, several collections of Sabbath poems. So he's riding horseback on Sunday morning. Horseback on Sunday morning, harvest over, we taste persimmon and wild grape, sharp sweet of summer's end. In time's maze over the fall fields, we name names that went west from here, names that rest on graves. We open a persimmon seed to find the tree that stands in promise, pale in the seed's marrow, Geese appear high over us, pass and the sky closes. Abandon has in love or sleeps, hold them to their way clear. In the ancient faith, what we need is here. And we pray not for new earth or new heaven, but to be quiet in heart and in eye clear. What we need is here. I have to look up and see what comes next. What's next? Prayer time? Yes. Good, I was gonna break out in song, so I'm glad that. This is our prayer time. Um, it's a time to bring your thoughts and prayers before this wonderful family and um, your joys and your concerns. So if it's okay with you, may I share some while I'm up here? I don't have a mic, so I can do it up here. I want to share that Molly Rose is with us today and getting better, we think. So thank you, Lord, and thank all of you for your prayers. My husband, George, is doing very well. He's be bopping around the house with his walker. He just had a hip replacement on Tuesday, so he's doing very, very well. Um, and my sister Gina it had um, shoulder su surgery and she's getting better. So all good news from our family. Thank you for your prayers. So Ginny has a microphone. If you would just raise your hand and share your, your concerns or your joys, Ginny would be happy to look, hand you a microphone. Well, I've got two things. Uh, one, I wanna celebrate Reverend Larry starting his ministry with us uh, this morning. Uh, I feel settled, more settled already. So, <laughs> yay. And uh, secondly, a uh, remembrance. I looked at my day journal this morning and four years ago that today, our dear Ed Morrison left us for God and the re re reunited with his beloved Florence. And I just wanted to remember Ed everything he did for our church and Florence too, and also for the community. Just to, uh, just to say a shout out for Ed this morning. Thank you, Frank. Any other joys or concerns? Oh, Carol. So I had a thin moment, but I didn't realize it until your sermon. Thank you, Reverend Larry. Um, yesterday I was in a hospital room with my nephew, Todd, who you know you've been praying for, many of us, um, who had had a stroke. And he's very compromised, and things are, are very dicey. Um, speech isn't that great, but I asked him if there was anything he wanted to say. And he struggled, and his words were, how's Uncle Rob? So in the midst of being so compromised, the thin moment was he wasn't down about himself. He was thinking about his uncle. So that was my thin moment, and I'm grateful. Thanks for making me see it. Sometimes it doesn't hit you right in the face. So thank you.
Uh, this week, a um, former colleague of mine who I've known for 20 years and worked rather closely with for um, 15 years um, died very suddenly. She was, uh, um, her name is Judy. She uh, was very prominent in the Farmington community and um, very dearly loved. And she died very suddenly in, in a really freak, tragic uh, accident. And she has a lot of um, a lot of family in the area, and uh, she was an absolute force to be reckoned with. And it just makes it makes it all harder just to not only um, not only um, process the fact that she's gone and her loss and her life, but just the circumstances and um, thoughts for her her family as they as they uh, negotiate that. Thank you. I'd just like to take a minute to uh, remember a dear friend of mine and perhaps many of you in the community. Uh, Victor Becker um, was a, a very prominent uh, helper. Uh, he was a world-renowned <coughs> stage and set designer around the world and lived here in Wakefield, uh, restored his own farmhouse down on 109 and uh, died of a tragic fall in his home. Uh, fell from the top of the second floor stairs, and um, by the time he got to the landing, uh, he was gone. And uh, he did so many th wonderful things um, besides around the world and his own accomplishments in his career. Um, he, he was the uh, brainchild of the restoration of the Opera House here in town. Um, he was the uh, director of the Farm Museum years ago. Uh, he was very involved in the restoration of the uh, tiny little opera house and the, the resource center building for the town uh, in, in Union. And uh, I'm going to miss him, and a lot of people in town are going to miss him, remembering Victor Becker. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Anybody else back here? Prayers for the DeWire family. Is that it? Okay. Do you want to see? I believe that it is Maureen's uncle. Is that right? Your what? Oh, her dad's brother that is in is the he? final stages of his life. Oh, I'm so, oh. That was sweet. Uh, continued prayers for the victims and the families uh, of the earthquake in Syria and in Turkey. And also um, for the Matiza family in Zimbabwe, uh, Reverend Matiza is the president of the UCC Zed. He and his wife were in a car accident uh, in the last few days. Um, she is under care and the roads in Zimbabwe are treacherous and uh, accidents are, are commonplace and hospital care isn't as good as it should be. So we want to keep uh, uh, Mrs. Matiza who does amazing outreach work in Zimbabwe in our prayers. Thank you. Okay. I have a few prayers from online. Oh, upstairs. A request for prayers from Josiah for his family as they still struggle to care for his grandmother and aunt. I again reiterating prayers as well for Turkey in Syria. Uh, prayers request from Anne for for someone named Audrey, 23 years old, just diagnosed with MS last week, um, and has had a tough time this past week. Prayer request from Tizia or Tizia's brother, Herman, who found out he has intestinal cancer. Tizia's brother. Also continued prayers for the family of Patty Golden and uh, also for Chuck Hodston as he continues to heal from his car accident. Are there any others? Any other? Oh, Margie. <laughs> It's just that um, I think we need to remember Ukraine and um, 
I, I don't even know where to begin with that, but I also have great sympathy for the Russian soldiers who have to fight this war, and it may not be their choice. Thank you all for those those prayers. As you all were talking, I was thinking how important prayer is. Sometimes it's the only thing we can do, but it is a powerful thing. Prayers matter. Prayers work. Sometimes maybe not the outcomes we think we want, but they do work. And I, I know that you all have been on a journey for several years that's been sometimes full of joy and ecstasy, sometimes full of not so much. It's been a winding journey, but God didn't promise us a linear path full of roses and golden daffodils. The spiritual journey is a winding one that takes us sometimes into dark places, into times of shadows, and it's often in those places where we learn the most. I think about what our communities would be like if churches like Wakefield were not here and the world feels colder and darker and dimmer if you weren't here. And it could be all that you do is lift prayers up every week to be a praying community that's praying for the life of Christ and the Christ vision to be real in this world. But I know you do a lot more than that and you've shouldered the journey so with so much resilience and so much strength. And I not only admire you for that, but I'm inspired by it. So I'm glad that you continue to pray and you continue to be faithful people of Christ in this world. We need you. I'd like you to, we're gonna join in this prayer together and then we're gonna go right into the Lord's Prayer. Um, at Lee, we say trespasses, so I've been saying trespasses for three years. I'm going to try to get my head to say debts, um, but if you hear trespasses, don't just don't let it throw you. I invite, you. I invite us all to pray together. Righteous God, we find ourselves wanting to retreat from the harsh realities of life. We can find ourselves slipped into high places and forget those that we have left behind. Concern for our neighbor too often dissipates at the point of our discomfort. Give us to wanting to dwell in your presence without being transformed with new energy for the work of your ministry. Hear these prayers as we pray. We're going to sing a beautiful song, God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale, number 32.
Jesus comes down to us as a gift of presence, compassion, and companionship. His entire life is a demonstration of committed generosity and stewardship. We too are called to present our lives as a gift to the God who has created us in the world that needs what we have to offer in time, talent, and treasure. Let us reveal the glory of God by the giving of our good gifts. And I understand we're going to have a tremendous anthem. <laughs> One of my favorite songs. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. You just do Louis Armstrong proud. <laughs> Remember, tall guys in the back. <laughs> Some of us didn't get the memo about the tie. <laughs>
generous God, may these gifts bring your glory and honor and meet the needs of your people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Continue to stand here with the only that we can use for 539. I just have one more poem. I promise not to do three poems every service, but this is one of my favorites. And yesterday I was at a memorial service for a colleague, uh, Reverend Neil Ferris, who was a longtime Unitarian Universalist minister, um, most recently at the Exeter UU. And this poem was read by his wife, Sylvia, in his honor. This is from Joy Harjo, who was the first indigenous person to be the poet laureate of the United States and was for three years um, and is just a magnificent poet and writer and musician. It's called Eagle Poem. To pray you open your whole self to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you and know there is more that you can't see, can't hear, can't know except in moments steadily growing and in languages that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. Like eagle that Sunday morning over the river, circled in blue sky and wind swept our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you, see ourselves and know that we must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathe in knowing we are made of all this and breathe knowing we are truly blessed because we were born and die soon within a true circle of motion. Like eagle rounding out the mourner, morning inside us, we pray that it will be done in beauty in beauty. May you all go in peace. It's a joy and a pleasure to be with you. Enjoy this beautiful day. Peace be with you. Thank you.